All right. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome. We've made it to the end of the day, the last session. So many good things going on at this conference. I always love it. It's one of my favorites, I think. Um, so this part of our farm to school track is really a time to just chat. Um, so we've set up some time to chat with Devon because he's already working with schools. Um, we have a small group, so I want to talk to everybody in here, kind of get to know the folks here. And then we have a bunch of resources to share with you as well. So this is kind of more of a informal space just to kind of get to know each other, talk about our experiences with Farm to School, and then we'll share, again, a lot of different resources that we put together to kind of support farmers in uh, getting in the Farm to School space or growing your Farm to School program. So uh, maybe we can do some introductions while we get started. So I'm Mariel. I'm uh, with MSU Extension. I'm a community food systems educator for Southwest Michigan, but I also do a lot of statewide stuff like for Farm to Institution and CSA Network. Um, so Devon, you want to go next? Yeah, Devon Wilson. I'm farming in Battle Creek, Michigan. Uh, we have a two acre urban farm. We farm organically. And we also have a mini grocery store on the property that we call uh, Pharmacy with the F. And so our kind of uh, uh, mission there is you know, serving food as medicine. So all of our stuff is simple ingredients. Um, we have grocery snacks, drinks. Um, and so I can talk more about that later. But yeah, happy to be here. Let me go over this side with Cheyenne. Hi, everyone. My name is Cheyenne Liberty. I work for the Michigan Department of Education, and my role is a farm program consultant. I help match our child nutrition program customers with food suppliers that want to sell Michigan grown foods to them. So if you're interested in getting into schools or expanding what you're already doing with schools, uh, please feel free to contact me. My business cards are up there, and I'd love to help you get connected. Hey everyone, I'm Kelly McClelland. I work with Mariel on the Community Food Systems team with MSU Extension. I'm based in Flint, and my kind of area that I cover is kind of Flint, Saginaw, based in the Midland area. Um, and similar to Mariel, I do a lot of work to support local food production, um, farm to school, school gardens, CSA, the local food hub, kind of everything fun that we all want. <laughs> awesome. Christina. Hi everyone, my name is Christina Petrovska. I work at Callens Valley Community College at the Food Innovation Center, where we also operate Valley Hub, which is a local food hub. Uh, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a dietitian and I'm a program coordinator for community education around uh, self-sufficiency on a home scale, so for, for residents who want to grow their own food or, or transform their landscapes. So we run a line of programs there. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Megan McManus. I'm with MSU Center for Regional Food Systems. Um, I'm part of the Farm Institution Farm to School team, and um, we're coordinating the Lake Michigan School Food Systems Innovation Hub Grants, a <laughs> long name. Um, so there's a lot of grants and funding opportunities right now for coming out and supporting um, youth selling schools. So I'm part of that. Can okay. help? Yeah. Uh, my name is Brooke Today. I am a farm to school coordinator in Traverse City. So I work under um, Northwest Education Services, which is like our ISD up there. Um, so I'm kind of the middleman between kind of helping connect farmers to my schools that I work in. Awesome. Or this website. Not up today. Hey, Julius, so we're just doing quick intros. Uh, my name is Julius Buzzard. My uh, pronouns are he and him. I'm the executive director of Growing Hope, a nonprofit uh, that works within the food system in Ypsilanti, Michigan, the other side of the state. Um, we do a lot of work. A big portion of what we do is uh, education, both with youth and with adults. Um, but really, like Growing Hope started with youth education, and that continues to be a big piece of what we do. So we're really involved in our farm and school uh, work in our county as well as like the office. Awesome. I'm Brian. <clears throat> um, nobody's special compared to everything everybody just said. That's amazing. Good job. Um, I grew up on a farm in uh, Covert, Michigan, also Hartford, Michigan, and um, currently a school bus driver. Um, I've always been curious and interested in, in growing things. 
I'm a crazy composter in my neighborhood. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's where I am right, right, right now. I'm looking at possibly having my family farm, but so here I am just learning and absorbing and meeting people. Awesome. Nice. School bus drivers are super important and special, so thank you for doing <laughs> that. We entrust our children with you every day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Say in back. So I'm Joe. Um, I'm a um, uh, semi-retired farmer That's true. Um, from the farm. Okay. Um, moved down here a while ago. Yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> 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 but uh, I'm, I'm a bee farmer, so I know a lot about bee. I, I also get involved with dirt and soil health. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as farm neighbors go, you know, I live on the uh, east side of Battle Creek, but my neighbor, Devon, Devon, <laughs> sort of like uh, west or something like that. I get lost when I go to the neighborhood. <laughs> but uh, not Devon. Pretty neat. He uh, he's he's got a nice farming model going. Yeah. Sweet. Awesome. Thank and Joe holds a really amazing farming conference in his basement that um, I've been to twice now, and it's like one of the best conferences I'm always looking forward to. So really appreciate Joe. He's very humble guy, but he's a soil master to say the least. And um, just happy to have you here, Joe. All right, well, thanks everyone. So I'll kind of have a little bit of an interview set up here, but we don't have to necessarily stick to this format <laughs> if we don't. Make it a group interview. Yeah, <laughs> group interview. Um, but first of all, since we have you up here, Javon, yes, yes. can you tell us a little bit about your farm in Battle Creek and anything that you want to chat about, like yourself and how you got into that farming or anything you want to share with the group? Yeah, so yeah. Um, and I can kind of keep going on a rant, so if you can check me on time. But basically, you know, I, like I said, I've been farming for going on 11 years now. Um, and how I got into it um, was pretty random, really. So my parents met working at Burger King, actually. Um, so no prior uh, history of farming in our family or anything like that. I didn't grow up on a farm. I, I grew up in an area similar to where I'm farming at now. And so... Basically, what made me want to farm was um, seeing a lot of, of patterns in my community of illness, disease, um, poverty, and things like this. And I always, I was kind of observant as a kid. I think I'm still kind of observant. And so I was questioning, why are things like this? Why my, I saw my grandmother battling with diabetes very bad her whole life. Um, cancer was in my family. And so I was just questioning, like, why is this happening? And so using the internet and stuff, I kind of started to connect some dots. And I say, okay, well, you know, all the food we have around us is pretty low quality. Um, our opportunities are not super vast to connect with our land and stuff like this. The only connection I had with my food was going to the grocery store, like with my mom and just like getting stuff from the shelves, you know? I literally didn't know that uh, seed, you put a seed in the dirt and it grows. I had no connection with the soil at all. And I think being in this world now so much, that seems kind of crazy, but I always have to like put, my, put that into perspective and remember there's so many kids who that's still their reality, you know, especially like where I'm farming at now. It's like I was, uh, when Joe was at my farm and I was kind of explaining to him, like, you know, I had like a 40 year old guy come to my farm and he saw a cucumber vine and he was like, what? Like he was blown away that that's how a cucumber grew. He didn't understand that it grew on a vine and it came from the dirt. You know, they just, so it, it's, we have to keep that in perspective that even though this is some of us, this is like our life, right? We live and breathe this stuff. But to a lot of people, there's a big disconnection from, to our food system. And so I always keep that kind of at the core of what I do. Um, and so Sunlight Gardens, our mission is to increase access to local food and inspire the next generation of farmers. Um, and we do that in a number of different ways. We have events on the farm. Um, like I said, we uh, created a grocery store where we accept EBT um, and double up food bucks. And the idea is basically, what's up, Chaz? 
Um, the idea is basically like we really want to create an op healthy option for our community. Like going back to my family having all this diabetes and cancer and stuff, you know, we realized like I call it kind of like the poverty like starter pack, but you have like your your Walgreens, your Dollar General, and then like your liquor store, right? And that's like the community that these are like our places that we go. And so there's not a lot of abundance and like health that can be created from that in my eyes. Super low quality food. Um, and so, yeah, it's just our idea is to create another option. We plan to um, focus, we have been focusing on that area and that's has shifted our model a lot. So like I used to do the farmer's markets. Now we don't do any farmer's markets anymore. Um, basically because we realized like we, we're really trying to reach the people that we're around. Farmer's market is a great, I love the market, but it's a, it's a privileged thing in a way. You know, it's a very uh, limited time slot. It's one day a week. People, some people don't know about the market or the hours or even how to interface with the market, right? Like when I first went to the market, I was like, what is this magical place, right? Um, so I think for us, it's really cool to be able to bring that right into our community and again, help people build that relationship with their food that I didn't have, that a lot of people don't get the opportunity to have. And so I think, it, yeah, it's really cool to be able to offer that in our community. Um, I mean, we've had really cool uh, experiences where people are just like, come to the farm and they're just like, thank you for being here. You know, like this is, this is great. Um, they're so excited. Like kids, when they get to connect with the dirt, it's like, you know, that's a different, it's a different lifestyle that a lot of these kids are not accustomed to at all. So seeing them um, interact with the soil, it, it's like very heartwarming. I've even had kids like just, we'll be hanging out at the farm after we do a task or something. And uh, this kid was like, he's like, I like this. And I'm like, what? Like, he's just like, just this, like, just like working in harmony with the land. And like, so it's really, for me, that's kind of our ideas, like increasing access to local food to, in my mind, it means so many things because I've realized like just putting, growing food and putting it in front of someone doesn't mean that it's necessarily accessible. You really have to build and cultivate that relationship with it. Want to eat healthier, understand why it's important to eat from biologically diverse soil and locally and things like that. And, um, so yeah, that's at the core of a lot of what we do is just helping people build that relationship. It's actually inspiring people to farm and to um, get their hands in the dirt and yeah, understand where their food is coming from. So we do events, um, we, we uh, make our own compost. We have about four hoop houses now. We're building another one this year. Um, and so yeah, it's kind of a, what we do in a nutshell. Thanks for that. Yeah, uh, so switching gears a little bit to talk about how you have worked in, within the school system. Because when we're trying to talk about you know, accessing food and getting kids exposed to these types of foods, a lot of their meals are being eaten at school. Sometimes their only meals right, are being eaten at school. So I know you've been working quite a bit on farm to school in a number of different ways. So you want to give us a little bit of overview of that? Yeah, so you know, again, helping people build their relationship with food, like to me it's important to do it early, as early as possible. I think that's the most effective way to do it. Um, and so for us, it's really been just um, about building relationships with these different schools um, and being able to understand like, you know, what their, what their um, students are going to enjoy eating. And, and for me, honestly, the most, the most successful relationships we've had with Farm to School is really like working with some of these um, cafeteria managers. Like some of them are really, they're rock stars. And I think that's what it takes to actually do Farm to School well, is you have to have a farm that actually wants to do it. But I think probably more importantly, you have to have that school cafeteria manager who is, you know, uh, being mindful of where they're sourcing things from but also making it fun for the kids. So like one of our most successful partnerships is probably with uh, Kalamazoo Public Schools actually. Um, Kirsten Strong is her name. I don't know if you guys might have known her. Amazing human being. And um, some of the stuff that she's done, like she set up a farmer's market in their cafeteria uh, for lunch one day. And she gives the kids some tokens and the kids actually get to go around 
like a farmer's market style and pick out their food based on that. And she does an amazing job. I think like they were buying, they were buying um, pea shoots from us, a ton of pea shoots. And I was so surprised. I'm like, you're, get, you're getting these elementary school kids to eat pea shoots? Like that is brilliant, this is incredible. And so, um, yeah, like we've had, so we work with them. Um, we recently started working with uh, YWCA um, Lynn Ann from there, and then a woman named Angie with um, Bright Lights, um, uh, which is like a preschool daycare in Battle Creek, too. So, yeah, kind of saying that to say, like, it's really been, I mean, that's our intention is to just grow high quality food and get it into the places where it's needed most, which to me, uh, the school system, there's an emergency in the school system right now with the quality of food that our kids are getting. It's like, I'm, and I'm pretty sure it's, um, yeah, I was talking to this guy and he was, they were getting a presentation on some, it was this large, like a, think of like a Cisco or like a Gordon Food Service type provider. But he was basically explaining how their main customers are schools and prisons. So it's like the kids in school lunch are eating the same thing as like prisoners are eating and... I think they all should be eating high quality food, right, in actuality. Um, but it's, to me, that's just like a very like kind of alarming fact. Like, you know, we need to make sure that our youth are getting high quality foods in, in, their, um, in their lunches, especially. And so, yeah, you know, I really have a vision that I think farmers, school systems and the government can collaborate um, and really provide an abundance of local food in the school system. So like the stuff that we're doing right now is awesome, but for me it's really just like scratching the surface, getting our foot in the door. Um, because it's, you know, it's like kale one week, collard greens, pea shoots, which is great, but th we're talking about like one item, right? So I really wanna see, and this is something that um, I think is possible through cooperatives and things like that, but like, you know, if, if, if we're having pizza, all the ingredients should be sourced locally, not just the tomatoes, but the, the wheat, the cheese, um, and so on, you know, milk, um, dairy, all of, we're in Michigan, one of the most agriculturally diverse states, so I think it's, you know, we have a, a great opportunity to do this. Um, and so, yeah, thinking into the future, like, that's kind of where I see um, farm to school really being evolving into into being something that is um just normal i just i just think it should be normal right like i think local food should just be normal like if you go we're talking about schools but even restaurants and everything like i just wish that that's that's kind of what i'm working towards is like it's just normal you don't have to like go to the back of the menu and find like the locally sourced stuff it's just like we're in michigan we're eating food grown in michigan it just makes sense for the and the, of course we can import our our great spices or anything we want to, but for the staple and the majority of stuff, it should be local, um, most definitely. And so the, pro the, the partnerships we have are a great step in the right direction, I think, but it's, to me, it's, it's a lot more work to be done, for sure. So I'm going off script now, because <laughs> I feel like you answered a lot of these other questions already. So how did you start those relationships with those food service directors? Did you just go and approach them like cold? How did you like find them? How did that work? Yeah, so they were all kind of unique in a way. So like um, the first one was we actually, uh, the school director reached out to me and wanted to do more farm to school programming. So we installed a uh, garden we built them a raised bed and installed a garden out there uh this is at bright lights um and that it really just started off simply like that and their students responded to it really well and so she basically hit me up and she and i think she's a 10 cents a male grantee um which is an amazing program i'm sure you guys are mostly familiar but helping schools uh kind of incentivizing schools to buy locally um, but she was in that program and so yeah, after I had made that initial, um, we had had that initial interface b doing the garden, she was like, what can we buy from you guys? And so um, we built it out that way. Um, what I think, I, probably the best way I can answer that is I feel like really just putting yourself out there is the best way to do it. A lot of, I've had a lot of um, people reach out to me because there is some of this money coming down and they're saying, hey, we're a school, we're looking for a farm to work with. Um, and so a lot of times people will point them to me just because I feel like 
we do a decent job of at least trying to um, get our name out there using social media and stuff and just let, making yourself visible. And that's kind of something that, um, and Chaz, you could probably relate to this, but it's hard to like, it's hard to like make content about your farm, you know, because you have to almost step away from farming to like do that. I, my strategy is kind of just like documenting what's already happening. So I don't put too much, I used to like make these like TikTok and stuff, whatever. And now it's just like, I don't have time to do that. So it's more about just documenting what we're doing and just showing it. And I mean, that's interesting in itself. You know, we, we really are, um, as urban farmers, doing something I think pretty unique. Um, and so, yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's the best way that we've been able to gain some of those partnerships is just putting ourselves out there. But again, looking into the future, it's really like, you know, how can we, um, work with urban, rural, and really just start to supply some of these institutions on a deeper level, not just, we got apples from, you know, the farm down the street this week, which is great. There's nothing against that, but just taking it a step further, I think is important. Yeah, speaking of that, you kind of said we're just scratching the surface. So what would it take to get to that? Like where you would like to be in the future with farm school, like in terms of resources or like, what, yeah. what do you need to get there? It takes a lot of um, scaling up, I think. So that's that's been a, a problem with us. I mean, honestly, we have a ton of demand. Like, we are working with three school systems alone. I'm on two acres. We could we could sell all of our food just to those schools and still not be able to provide everything they need, right? So that's some of the problem that we're running into now. Is like, you know, we have our on-farm store. We have restaurant customers, nonprofit customers, as well as these schools. And so to be at the scale to service all these, it really takes, um, you know, certain amount of employee resources, equipment and things like that. And so that is what I think is kind of the future is figuring out how can we work collab collaboratively and cooperatively to like leverage, you know, leverage cheaper prices for our compost. If we're doing group buying, how can we get cheaper seeds? How can we um, share equipment, share resources. Hey, I have a sweet brand new tractor. Traz, you need to borrow it for the week. You know, these kind of relations, because right now I'm using a BCS and I, you know, I'm thinking you're kind of the same, a lot of hand tools in our operations. And so to, to be able to really service these institutions, we have to scale beyond that. Um, and so that's a lot of the thing. I, I see a lot of resources going into like um, technical assistance and things like this, but I feel like, you know, we really have to start looking at the the scale and capacity of our farms, especially our smaller local farms, what can we actually produce? And then what kind of, um, yeah, what kind of impact can we have working together, right? Because I'm, I mean, I don't, I don't do animals. I'm not like educated on how to farm animals, but I know farmers who are, you know, I know amazing farmers who, um, you know, ha there's a farmer, she has 30 acres and she does um, pigs, cows, all this stuff. And so, yeah, how can we leverage each other's expertise and skills, resources and funding and really start to, um, yeah, I think it's super important to scale some of these farms up. We have to get away from just, you know, it, it's not get away from, but in addition to, because I think the urban, the urban model represents such a great way to interface with your community because you're right there. And that's something that rural farmers sometimes don't have the benefit of because you're often in silos, you're on five, 10,000 acres. But I mean, we're, you know, I hear my neighbor's dogs barking and like we hear arguments people are having, you know what I mean? This is just, we're very, this is an integrated community. We're right, we're right in there. So I think it's in a, did not take anything away from that, but realizing the, ur I feel like the urban farm purpose is somewhat more educational because it's, again, increasing access to local food is more than just putting food in front of someone. You have to educate them. It's a mindset shift. And so, um, yeah, how can we, in addition to having urban farms, how can we start to manage larger amounts of acreage, whether it's co co cooperatively um, or, you know, just one farm scaling up. But, yeah, I see that as really the most clear way forward in my mind. Great, thank you for that. You. Does anybody else have questions for Devon? No? Yeah. So um, you said scaling up and you're an urban farmer. Would that 
I hear like more equipment. Would you want to expand land and like get somehow get more urban land for that? Yeah, definitely. I think urban land and rural land for sure. Um, yeah, urban and rural and like I'm just super interested in the collaboration of those two. Um, they need to come up with a grant for us to pay employees. A hundred percent, yeah. Because, you know, what you run into is like, like every, what's why I want to People like to come to the party when the party's done. Like, it's only a handful of people that want to set up the party. Yeah. And, and or clean up the party, clean up after the party. And so, um, a lot of our funding that we have access to doesn't necessarily go around manpower. And you can have all the money, all the bells and whistles, but if you don't have the actual human resource to do it, it's like, you run into more of the problems that you already had. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that I've always been thinking about in terms of like, how do we help each other necessarily really like in terms of like people who are able to give funding, are we able to tweak things to make where, where we're able to pay for work, pay our workers mm -hmm. because it's, you know, you get people that come around to the garden and they want to, but in terms of like making a profit and like you need someone to actually like be on the land with you, like, mm -hmm. and going through these processes and understanding some of it. And so I think, I know at least for me, that's like a, a missing link. Like, how do you get, how do we get the people actually involved in that experience? Like, Cause like I'm saying, people, the party is getting the food, mm -hmm. you know, maybe coming to an event, this, that, and third, but it, there's so many other things that go into making that possible. And without adequate help, you end up, you, you end up running into some of the position where you're like, how do I scale up with what I have? Right. Exactly. Yeah. When you're constrained by not only land and tools, but also people. Man, yeah. I, like, I know. I don't, he does two acres, I do a third of an acre, and so I have like over 50 bids with my space, but, you know, even though that's a little manageable for myself, I could get way more done with like, where if I could actually pay two people. Yeah. Just two more people. Yeah. And then like actually pay them, I could get, I could max more, maximize more off that space. Yeah. So. Definitely. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. I think we have to look at what are what metrics are we aiming for? Because we say we want to like create new farmers, create opportunities for farmers. But if we're create opportunity for a farmer just to serve like a farmer's market, mm -hmm. to me, that's not that's not the impact that I think we're really looking to make as farmers. It's like we want to feed people on a large scale. And um, yeah, you know, it takes more than just a five, ten thousand dollar grant here and there for, and a lot of, and again, a lot of the time the funding is, that comes in is so restrictive that it's like you can only buy a website with this money or whatever, and it's like I don't need a website, I need, <laughs> I need a, a, an employee. Yeah. To come out here and, mm -hmm. just for a couple of hours. You know, yeah. It's not like you're gonna use them for eight hours, but to have. To be able to have a grant set aside where you like, you got ten, fifteen thousand dollars to pay a person, a person or two through the summer for part-time hours. That's that's a a whole like load like taken off you. This it is, cause yeah, cause we need time to work on the business. Like, like, yeah, work the business and like yeah, like have like plan it like, cause it gets to a point where you like you start to see it's like oh. It's not the food that's gonna make me money. So you gotta have like services and systems in place to be able to draw in funds to actually sustain you doing the work you wanna do. Yeah. And I think once we get to a certain scale, the food is gonna make us money, but it's about getting to that scale. I mean, I know for, with us, like when I first, we bought our property in 2020, and I, I had two guys volunteer with me for a whole year like 
luckily, like, if they wouldn't – and that, I mean, it was so noticeable. The amount of work we got done that year and the trajectory that it set us on, um, I was able to pay them the next year. Now they're, like, pay – I mean, it's, we pay them, like, 12, 15 bucks an hour. It's not much, but – they, I would have never been in the position to be able to pay them if they didn't volunteer a year's worth of time. And they were luckily so cool. They just wanted to learn. And so I think there is some opportunities to like, you know, teach people and people see value in that. But I recognize that's rare. That's a rare, you know, I don't plan on having people work for me that long for free probably ever again. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's a super important part of this is like, we're, we're working with the school systems. There's money to buy this food from local farms, but what, what, what is the health status of our local farms? How much can we produce? And um, yeah, what support, what systems are supporting that? Actually scaling up farms. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, yeah, yeah. Chaz, do you want to quick introduce yourself? Sorry, you didn't get uh -huh. a chance to, and everybody else is doing that. <laughs> Chaz, uh, um, Owner of Rooted Love Farm here in town in Kalamazoo. It's off Gold Road, 2535 Gold Road. And I, I, say I operate about a third of an acre, and I've been doing that for about it's about year five, I believe now. So I've been doing that, and I'm just like talking similar to Devon. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out ways to actually scale up, to mm -hmm. actually produce more because. There's a demand for the, for this, especially in a local setting. Um, a lot of Kalamazoo is looking for local farmers, growers, artisans, and things like that to like create this sustainable system. And so, but much of sustainability is about having, to me, it's actually having the human resource to to man that. And so. We have, we have people around these, what I would say, we have people around different fields to, to help out with that, but the main part is like, for me, is like, just like finding like adequate help and, and or being able to pay them to, because um, it sounds good to, you know, to have, to have someone do something free, but we're not, all, we're all doing something for, for something like, I, it's good that they're able to take food from they coming to work for me and they get food that they didn't get. But, you know, if they spent like four or five hours, they could have been using four or five hours to actually make, maybe that food maybe not be supplement the money that they could have made that actually helps their family. And so you get people that are sparingly help you out. Um, but so, and I run a biodiverse so I'm not limited to like one crop and so those are things that I kind of manage around myself in terms of like what is my actual goal is it to make money or to do these type of things because um, you start to have to kind of like do some focus cropping but you know it's my personal belief that doesn't do well for your your environment long term like you yeah, you make money like for maybe the season, but you have to continuously do other things that's going to cost you more money in the long run by not having uh, a biodiverse uh, environment. Um, and so, me personally, I use I do a lot of uh, well, where I do I crop stuff together, um, mm. so that I pair them together based upon their actual needs and what they're doing. And a lot of it's just kind of paying attention to what's already going on in nature. Yeah. Um, but uh, you have to have you have to create those times. I believe we can you can create lanes into doing it. And a lot of it's so much of a a, a mental shift. But I think in terms of like when we're saying like what what can we do? And I would say, if you can help me find a way to like bring a couple more people in to like that want to help out, especially like the people who want to do farming, how do we, how do we help pay them so they can learn and mm -hmm. yeah. continue to do the farming? Because yeah. uh, a lot of 
I had the privilege of being able to go like speed up my whole farming trajectory by going to work on a farm. Mm -hmm. I had the dream, but I went and worked on the farm. I got paid, did that for two seasons, and then I like that totally changed like what I thought I could do as an individual. And so, but I wouldn't have been able to do it at first. Like I couldn't have been able to sustain it to mm -hmm. do it like two years without getting some form of payment. Yeah. That's reality, like. Yeah, I had, I had twins at the same time. Yeah, you did. I don't know how you did that, Chaz. <laughs> it's one of those things you just kind of make a, uh, a, a personal decision, but I think if when we get together and like we're asking like what can be done and we have the effect to do things, I think it's important to kind of like really not say things that where people want to spend the money on, but actually look at things that are really that can really help the the, the end goal of what like I think all of when everyone gets in the room, we all want sustainability, and so I think it's about actually picking out all of out of all the things that we said. What are the most important things that uh, help us get to sustainability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, so I, I think human resource is a good part of it, like, you often. I, all the farmers I know, they do it by themselves with a couple, maybe be lucky to have your family members pitch mm -hmm. in with you and help you out, but to be able to, like, men, like, I heard about, like, the mentor program that's going on, just to have those type of things in place where people can learn make some money, build networking, because that's really that's what helped me out is being able to work around other farmers, meet other people, and then it's like it's a whole nother little family that, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, oh, okay. And you get to know people in that way, and that helps out in that, in that regard. Yeah, definitely. I thought I saw a hand in the back. Was that you, Joe? So, in the, have you guys done much with this, the working CSA part? You know, not running the whole thing, but so you're using the CSA's working deal to get some of the labor. I mean, way back when, it's been a while since we did that, but we saw that as a good thing. But I do see where you're going with the schools and the local community. Um, and I understand going for grants. In the short term, I think that's doable. In the long term, you've got to make the thing stand on its own two feet. Right. So, and, and sometimes that includes producing something of maybe short term higher value um, while the public is being re educated in respect to value of the food. Uh, I think that's going to change coming up. So, so, I have a lot of farms that do flowers. And, we just had to be careful that the flowers didn't take over because they tended to be higher dollar, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but if you could regulate it while you're getting the food side going, I, I I think the potential's in the food in the future. So back to the CSA, have you tried the working share as a part of the deal? I have not. I have not personally. We have a more recent. We're actually going to be doing a CSA for a school like a $30 a week box, um, so it's not a ton, but I have not tried that. Was that for an ECE or a For an ECE. Yeah. yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah, Gary actually helped me out with that. Nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, that sounds like a familiar concept. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've heard about that, cool. So, yeah. Is that like a, is that something like, is that commonly something that was traditionally ran, how a CSA was ran, like with work, like, Kind of like a so, cooperative farmer. I mean, I got, you know, growing up on the farm when I first was mentioned CSAs, I thought it was a Catholic relief organization or something. <laughs> 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 the most farmers still don't know what a CSA is. Yeah. Um, but bought a busload of people from Lansing to Kalamazoo to Bruce Schultz's farm, he had five acres, he had 60 family members, and 
by the 60 by 4. He had a crew of 15 that work a half day, but he had four crews. So his was a full CSA back in that day. I mean, he did it for how many years and then he went on to something else. But that was the first one I really saw that was functioning on that scale. Um, Lord Delenn at Michigan State wrote a book on all the ones that were functioning back in the late 90s. Um, a lot of change since then. Um, but it, it, what I'm saying is, I think it can be part of that deal. I like what you're doing at the schools, and it's you know saying you're going to bring students out to work. Well, there's more time put into that than you might get out of it. <laughs> you got to start someplace. Yeah. You, you need people that are dedicated and been there a while. I mean, our first year is a issue. There's a lot of training. You know, it's a lot of investment, but it does work. Hmm. Um, Thanks. The, the higher dollar thing, I, I just think, you know, flowers is only one model, but you just got to keep looking at that. Um, but you get the right combination of unique food, it's, it's going to be a higher dollar in the future. And we don't, you know, in the short term, you got to compete with the box store. Not long term. You know, this is a different deal. And, and you've got to market it accordingly, too. Big time. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And I love the idea of like centering kind of your work in this is just like making sure that we're improving the soil health of whatever land we're farming. Um, because, yeah, I, don't, I mean, everybody might not have been here, but Joe has an amazing conference in his basement. And some of my biggest takeaways from that is just like the the direct connection between the health of our soil and the health of our people. Um, and it's so clear, you know, when we're, con when we're growing in basically sterile soil that we're relying on sprays to make these crops work. Um, it's just like very clear to me the connection of like disease and how many people are on pharmaceuticals and things in our country. Um, and so that's another reason why I like the school approach is because it gives me a challenge to grow a lot of food and in turn I feel like that will heal a lot of soil. Um, and so that's, I mean, yeah, that's like what I think would be just amazing is a cooperative of farmers working together to serve institutions and really um, all at the core of our cooperative is healing our soils. Um, and I just feel like that would, you know, alleviate, obviously it's going to be a, a thing over time too, right? Probably over decades. But I think we would see our population become a lot more healthy, less mental health issues, um, you know, definitely less like diabetes and cancer and things like that. And um, yeah, I mean, even some of the more like detrimental things like having clean drinking water into the future, right? These are things we really have to be cognizant of. And I think Joe does an amazing job of um, bringing that into reality and kind of painting the picture so it's a little bit easier to understand. But it is, yeah, it's a very, very um, sensitive thing to me. Like the health of soil and the health of people is so connected and, um, the more that we can just be producing nutrient dense food, high quality food and getting into our school systems, I think it will solve a number of problems. And I think the big thing I see is kind of matching government policy with that idea. Because right now um, it's like a lot of resources going into the commodity crop system, right? And, they, and a lot of those crops never end up on our plate. And they also are devastating our land and soil to produce them on the scale that they do. So that's part of the reason that I've been going to DC and advocating for more resources to be allocated to smaller farms um, and specialty, cr specialty crops. I mean, it's so funny to me that we call what we eat specialty. <laughs> you know, it's like, I feel like, the, and it, even the organic thing, it's like, I feel like the chemical, like, let's just call this chemically grown. And then everything else can just be normal. Yeah. It's just food. Like, this is natural food. Like, 
Um, so it's funny, and I feel like, I mean, it is kind of like, I call it like, it's like mental warfare going into the grocery store sometimes, because especially if you don't have education on this, it's like, well, man, should I be eating organic? What, what is actually healthy? Um, this says sugar-free, but it's like, what is dextrose and high fructose corn syrup? And syrup? So it's so much, you know, again, it's a mindset shift. And I think there's a lot of things in our society where we've been just conditioned to accept this low quality, you know, food, commodity based ag system. And I think um, that's why I kind of said in the beginning, like, I think it's a it has to be a working between farmers, school system and the government. I believe plays a part in it too, unfortunately, because they could be hard to work with, right? But um, yeah, I think it does. There needs to be some collaboration amongst those kind of three. I think. Nice. Maybe we have time for one more question. There's one. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of the farm to school work that we do is centered around the educational piece. We're going, we're doing like I think similar work to like building growing spaces and connecting uh, curriculum with like, hands-on education. Uh, we don't have as much, we haven't had as much experience with getting food into our cafeterias. And a barrier for us has been, um, we don't, our, our school system contracts out. So it is like Sodexo and um, Chartwells. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to hear if you have any experience or tips for working, trying to work with uh, those types of I would definitely yeah no that's a great point and I think that's one of the big problems we have and I think um, really I mean pointing them to a lot of these resources like um, 10 cents a meal and basically just incentivizing it right because I mean that's a lot of the, that's the reality is a lot of these people are thinking about the money and it's the logistics of it I think they're so set in their ways it's so easy just to order every single thing that you're serving from the same company, and some of it's probably pre-cooked, whatever, take the stress off of your cafeteria staff. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, it's, it is a thing where I feel like you kind of almost have to be a salesman a little bit and be like, hey, like, you know, explaining them the benefits of it, obviously, but also like, hey, there is money to help you guys get some of this. Um, and then, I mean, really, I. Some of the stuff, like, I don't know if you're in here, but um, Kirsten Strong from KPS, and then um, there's, there's a couple others, but, like, those cafeteria, she's a cafeteria manager for a school, and she's been doing really cool programming. And so I almost think, like, we need to give her a platform in a way to, like, be able to show and uh, some of her models and, like, collaborate with other people to show these cafeterias, like, hey, it's not impossible. And it can actually be really fun and really rewarding stuff, too. I mean, like, I think one of the questions I know we won't get to it, but it was like, what's one of the most rewarding parts of this farm to school stuff? And I think it's just like when they send us pictures back of the kids eating collard greens mm -hmm. at school. And it's just like so cool. Like, I've n I would never expect I, I literally ate the same spicy chicken sandwich every day for school lunch, you know, and a chocolate milk. Um, and so... I think sharing those wins with them, like showing them what's possible and kind of connecting them with some of these rock stars like Kirsten and other people that can show them the model like, hey, this is like Kirsten, she set up a farmer's market in her cafeteria. Like, that's just dope. Like, that's just, you know, that's just so cool. And so I think the more that we can um, normalize it and, you know, show them that there is not only is it fun, rewarding and, and epic and cool. But it's also incentivizing it. Yeah, there's some programs that can help you guys get some money to do that. Michigan food thing where they basically pay them double for. Oh, double up food bucks or? Ten cents a meal. That's that's what it is. Yeah, ten cents a meal. Yeah. Extra money for. So that's. No, that. That's what they. Once they knew that, they were more apt to have a conversation because they writing it off anyway. Yeah. So it's like if you could provide, I would suggest starting with something like small and like some, some leafy green, something that you can potentially that they can start to use all the time because when 
what I've been running into is they want more of the food more than I could give them oh, in, yeah. the, in a period of time. And so, but something small like, I think they will want potatoes and onions and stuff like that, but that stuff only come around like what a, one part of the time of the year. And so when mm -hmm. you, that's why the, the coalition of being able to come together with other farmers and being able to uh, sell, be able to, you specialize in a crop and you do that and we give off and that way you better, you better off able to like, they do it around their menu, you know, like how they want to, what they, what the food, what food they want to uh, give to the students. But I think they got the laws now where they have to change, they have to implement so many certain kind of foods in the food now. So it's like, it's room for, it's just about making the connections, I believe. a lot, And a lot of it, I took it as a gorilla approach, like, I'll talk to my daycare or I'll take my kids. <laughs> That's so sweet. Like, oh, I'm and they were looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I had to come back and bring them the paperwork to show them. And then it made them like, oh, okay, this is a legit thing. Yeah. So. And yeah. about is still chart while it's coming to public? I think last night they were. Is it what? I'm sorry. Are they chart wells managed? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest okay. with you. Yeah. They are. They are? Okay. They were too, so he's successfully doing that. So. They are chart well? Wow, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah, I didn't even know. So, there you go. yeah. No, and I think, the, I mean, the incentive thing is so big, right? And I see that even in, like, the nonprofit world and stuff. It's like there's so much incentive to just write a beautiful grant, you know? <laughs> like, we just got to write the most epic grant and frame it in the best way, and I feel like that creates this pattern and system where, the funding is going to the people who can write the best grants, not the people who can grow the most food, heal the most soil, and feed the most people. And so that's like a good, maybe a good place to end this. Yeah. At. Like we can think about like, <laughs> but yeah, like, <laughs> right. How do we maybe shift the incentive or like, you know, change our parameters of success a little bit to say like, you know, it's not just about writing great grants and framing who is actually growing food, who is, um, you know, feeding kids, I think, yeah. would be a pretty good um, meter of success. Yeah. How many fresh meals got to a kid f out of this grant, right? Um, and so, yeah, the incentives are so powerful, man. They're so powerful, so... That's always my thing is how can we incentivize healthy eating? How can we make it fun? How can we make it familiar? And um, I wish Kirsten was here because, like, she's so good at that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Javon. Yeah. I hate to cut off this conversation because it's no, so good. We need to have more of these conversations, I think, is also another learning out of this. Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you, guys. All right. Okay. So Kelly's just uh, going to do a quick rundown of some resources, and then we'll wrap up. We've got, like, four minutes left, so we're going to speed through these. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I support the 10 to Meal grant at MDE, and so we decided to schedule just a really open office hours. If you have any questions about 10 cents a meal or about selling to schools and child care centers, um, we, if you scan that QR code, it'll take you to a Zoom registration for a meeting on Monday at 3 p.m., I think, sometime in the afternoon. Um, oh, it's on there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so, it, yeah, it's open office hours. It's going to be, like, not really a, like a scheduled meeting or anything. Just come if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. And that's it. Yeah, they work with the Chartwell's people. So yes. So if you have any like, problems getting in with the school and want that connection, they'll be the liaison. For sure. Yeah, yeah, we can definitely make connections with Chartwell's. And they are open to working directly with small producers. And their food service directors do have the, the, the capacity to make payments directly to small producers. Yep, there might be a little bit more steps to follow with like setting up agreements around food safety and things like that, but they're, they want to work with you on that. So definitely reach out.
quickly talk about, this is also from Cheyenne and her team. Um, there is a map of 10 cents a meal grantees across the state. So this QR code, this one is not on this, but it's on this. Um, no, not that one. It's not on any of these, is it? Um, no, okay. You can sign up right here to have it sent to you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so it's a map of um, 10 cents a meal grantees across the state, which we've talked about 10 cents a bunch today. These are probably your best places to start in terms of school districts that are interested in buying local, have this money incentive to buy local, um, and would be great partners in your farm to school work. Speaking of grants, um, <laughs> Megan, do you want to talk about this grant opportunity very briefly? Um, yeah, uh, really quick. It's a five-year grant for four states in the Lake Michigan region. We're one of them. We have two types of funding, and it's for projects that are to improve school meals, but it's open to farmers, uh, nonprofits, uh, agencies, food businesses, schools. Everyone can apply for them. You just need a school to be a partner or write a letter of support for you, but um, we will fund all kinds of expenses, including labor and so <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, please check that out. Um, I talked to you guys already, but um, yeah, <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Um, two other resources that have QR codes on here. There is a video series from the Michigan Department of Education. We started our morning with some of one of those videos. Um, just really great inspiration. And if you want to kind of see who has been doing farm to school work across the state, um, they've put together some stories in video form. Um, and then another series that you can watch that's recorded um, that I believe is Megan and Cheyenne and Wendy, who was in here earlier, is a school food basic series. Um, that was originally prepared for the Michigan Local Food Council Network, now is recorded and online for anyone to view to learn more about school food and all of the different colors of vegetables that have to be on kids' plates every week and everything in between. Um, additional resources with websites also all on this handout, 10 cents a meal, Michigan Farm to School, Michigan Farm to Institution Network, which is kind of the group that made this session today happen, Cultivate Michigan, our MSU Extension Community Food Systems team, Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development, Michigan Department of Education, the National Farm to School Network, and USDA's Farm to School Resources are all partners with you in this work of getting more local food in schools. Um, so reach out. Here's all the info that you can digest at a later date, because if you're anything like me, you're tired right now. Um, and we just want to thank you so much for coming. If you were with us all day, thanks for sticking with us. Um, we do have a quick evaluation if you would like to scan this QR code or visit that link. There's also an overall evaluation for the whole day today that there should be a QR um, somewhere in your program, or we have paper ones of the overall evaluation if you'd like to fill that out. Oh, on the back of your name tag, perfect. Awesome. And I'll, I'm gonna pass these out to make sure you get these amazing resources.